that I need for you
that he's here with us. Amen. If you've joined us online, we're going to pray for uh, several needs here. Um, and first off, we'll pray for our leaders, Prescott, Arizona. We just finished our Bible conference. Amen. We're going to uh, be praying for the new churches that have been planted. Uh, uh, and I want you to keep these families in mind for not only uh, right now in this prayer time, but throughout the week so that they can get situated. These are brand new works and uh, brand new pastors and uh, five international works. We're going to believe that. I'm going to mention them in a minute here uh, with the announcements. But let's pray for Pastor Greg and Lisa Mitchell. Let's pray for uh, the Cassios and the Moraleses. Let's pray for uh, Pastor Diego and Kelly Galvan. Amen. And all that got accomplished uh, last week in Prescott, Arizona, uh, those sponsored delegates to get on fire and to be redirected and to uh, become refreshed when they go back to their cities, that God will be glorified through their ministry, through their involvement and, and through their lives as they are supernaturally serving God through their church. And let's believe God for more and more of what God is doing more miracles, amen, and more churches planted. Let's also pray for Paul and Linda Campo, Chip and Lori Ganeer in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Let's remember the Suspanskis in Jacksonville and the Kings, amen, as they are assisting there. Let's also lift up my pastor, Keith Sullivan, and the East Rochester congregation uh, and for their pursuit of a new church building. Let's believe God for the miraculous for their uh, ministry to flourish all their new converts uh, and those that went to conference that they'd be stoked man that they would be on fire and they would start getting it uh, like never before let's pray for miracles in their church service this morning the souls that are getting saved the visitors are being directed let's pray for their altars to be filled amen let's pray for anointing upon their service Amen. Let's pray for the local needs here in Greece, uh, New York. Let's pray for a few prayer requests we have uh, here. And uh, the first one, uh, thank God Claire has been healed. Amen. God is faithful to answer our prayers. Uh, Angela Speranza and Joe Graziano, both recovering from the cancer treatments. Let's pray for Kenny's little girl. Let's pray for Elaine and her husband. Let's also lift up... Uh, uh, Gina, who is Lawrence's fiance, her daughter, has uh, a fresh bowel with cancer. Let's believe God for a miracle to that situation. Amen. God can do miracles. He's still in the business. Amen. He's not lost the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the equation. He's not lost the uh, recipe for miracles. He's still available. He wants to help you personally in your life with your issues and your needs as well. Perhaps there's a need in your life I did not mention, amen, and I want you to just give me a lifted hand 
as a sign to me when God sees your hand if you're online and you're going to pray we're going to knit our hearts together we're going to believe God for your miracle as well in this prayer time amen brother David can you please open us up in prayer when we subside Lord there's nothing you can't do Lord you're in control and God we consciously submit ourselves to your plan God we surrender all that we have to you God that you could use our life that you could be blessed, God, that you could bring forth miracles uh, in our families and in our lives, God. I pray for healing all around, healing for those that are sick with COVID, God. Uh, I pray for the economy to turn around, God. I pray for personal needs, uh, issues that people are going through, Lord, God. I pray for these that are sick uh, and these that are recovering. I pray for miracle conversions, God. Fill this church to overflowing, God. Give us salvation, uh, wrought uh, in the heavenlies, God, as people surrender to you, God. I pray for miracle conversions Jesus, in Greece, New York, God. I pray for Bill Reilich, the and health town supervisor, and body and be shut all our surrounded by lies, God, we are surrounded by people, the our own agendas, agenda, anything so but you, Jesus. Over. We thank you, Lord, that you are trustworthy, that you have a plan, that you are oh, coming sure. soon to fix this mess, Lord. We oh, ask, sure. Lord, that you Guide us to people that need your help. Yes, Guide Lord. us to people who are willing to turn to you, who are not so stuck in their heathen ways that yes, they Lord. don't have any to, any Gracious. hope for you, Lord. Go past them. I realize there aren't many left, but get us to them, Lord, because you're coming soon. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, God, be glorified. We lift up the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I want to thank everybody for coming. Let's take a minute to greet one another, make everybody feel welcome. Yeah, right. Praise God, it's good to be saved, amen, and in the church, amen, where Jesus is ministering through his people and in this congregation here. We're so thankful for your coming here and you're joining us online this morning for our morning service. We'll be back tonight at 5.30 for evening prayer on Sunday night. We also have another service amen with a new sermon and there'll be new people here and uh, there'll be a worship an opportunity for you to sing songs and give God glory in your life amen if you're not aware of where we're located we're in the uh, Stone Ridge Plaza in Greece New York right behind Buffalo Wild Wings and uh, you're welcome to come and see what God is doing we practice social distancing and all the COVID-19 uh, recommendations guidelines and uh, we want to invite you to come to church and uh, feel God's presence here and be with us and be a part of the assembly. Amen. The ecclesia is the Greek word.
for the called out ones from the world, amen, and into the church, into the assembly, into meeting with God's people, hallelujah. We'll be back on Wednesday night for our midweek service at 7.30, 6.30. This Saturday we will be outreaching once again at 11 o'clock. If you have any questions about that, you want to get involved in what God is doing in Greece, New York, amen. We will be handing out flyers, talking to people about the love of Jesus and about uh, what he's done in our lives. Amen. Giving God glory and uh, an opportunity for you to invest your life, to participate in the church, what God is doing in the earth through the church and through individuals. Amen. Giving your testimony is such a privilege. Amen. To people that are open. Amen. And what God is doing behind the scenes. He's orchestrating uh, different uh, people to intersect with you throughout the week, amen, and be uh, a Pentecostal Christian, be on fire, and be evangelical. That means you're going to hand out flyers and talk to people throughout the week, amen. I'd like to give a quick testimony about our outreach yesterday because we went to the mall, and for about an hour or so, an hour and a half, we talked to some people there and uh, gave them our testimony and begin to plant seeds. Uh, some seeds are going to fall by the wayside. Some seeds are going to fall on shallow ground. Yes, we understand that. And some seeds are going to fall among people that uh, have the cares of this life and the riches and the, the worries and the anxieties and the cares of this uh, this world to, to choke the life out of them. But yes, there are those who will receive the word the seed that falls on good ground. And those are the people who wind up praying and who wind up uh, uh, giving their lives to Jesus. I want to thank God because I was able to talk to a young man. Um, and um, his name is Julio. I want you to give God glory because he prayed with me. He gave his life to Jesus. Amen. Let's praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah. Thank the Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank God that people respond to the gospel. They have a need, a deep burden of sin in their lives and they understand when you begin to minister to them that it can be lifted off of them and they can be clean thank god for him begin to pray for him i believe he's planning on coming wednesday night let's uh believe god together that uh, every demon that is going to try to keep him from his destiny would be squashed and put out of the way amen let's take our offering right now this is the anointing at bethany and it's from Mark 14, verses 3 through 8. And now, uh, Jesus being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as Jesus sat at the table, a woman came in, having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. This is an expensive perfume. Some say a year's wages or salary. Then she broke the flask and poured it on Jesus' Head. But there was someone there who were indignant among themselves and said, Why was this wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. And you always have the poor with you. And whatever and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But for me, you do not have me always. She has done what she could. She has come before him to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, this woman, what she has done will be told as a memorial to her. There's many levels here that we can tap into. Think about, uh, you know, people, they hear that you're, you're going to church. Why do you go to church so much? And, and you're giving your money there. What a waste. And you don't know where that money's going. Uh, how can you trust those people? Uh, and people will begin to criticize you for your faith. It's your money. You can do what you want with it. And you can invest your money in the kingdom of God. Maybe getting saved you remember uh, people in your life will begin to criticize you for your faithfulness and your faithfulness to give and pay your tithes. And they would criticize you. But this is something, amen, that's between you and God. Nobody can force you to give or to not give. Amen. 
I believe God's going to constrain your heart and show you what a joy it is to give to the work. Amen. What a privilege it is that we can invest in this local church in Greece, New York. And uh, this year, believe God in 2021 that we're going to become self-supporting. I mean, there's going to be no room left in this building because there will be so many people here. And not only people and numbers, but also people that have revelation about giving. Amen. Let's give to God. Let's create a memorial. Can I have the usher come forward? And we're going to give to the work. You can connect online if you want to make a donation. Uh, there's a link uh, that Melissa is going to show you. Praise God. Brother D, can you pray for <coughs> Yeah, done. The we're not giving to people. We're not giving to the church. We're giving to you. Yes, Lord. For you have done great works in our lives. And your grace. We offer our differences, our little bits that we offer to you, Lord, to use for your purposes. And thanksgiving for what you've done in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. The Lord bless you. with us, your tithes and offerings besides. Amen. Let's get started here. Matthew 8, verses 23 through 27. We're going to read that scripture in a moment here. A jeweler gives as one of the sure tests for diamonds, the water test. The water test is a sure test, he says. An imitation diamond is is never so brilliant as a genuine stone. If your eye is not experienced enough to detect the difference, a simple test is to place the stone under water. The imitation diamond is practically extinguished. A genuine diamond, on the other hand, sparkles under water and is distinctly visible if you place a genuine stone beside an imitation underwater, the contrast will be apparent to the least experienced eye. Many seem confident in their faith, so long as they have no trials. But when the waters of sorrow and affliction overflow them, their faith loses brilliancy. It is under these circumstances that the true children of God shine as genuine jewels. Amen. The trials for our testing and growing as Christians enable us to find out what we are made of. Let's read our scripture and find out what we are made of from the book of Matthew, chapter 8, verse 23. Then Jesus got into the boat, and uh, his disciples followed him. Suddenly, a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. Verse 26, Jesus replied, You of little faith, why are you afraid? Then Jesus got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. 
Verse 27, the men were amazed and asked, what kind of a man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Amen. I've entitled this sermon this morning, Gonna Be All Right. I want you to know when Jesus is with us, it's going to be just fine. Amen. Our first need to look at is to not drown in the cares of life, the trials, the situation, the consequences uh, for bad decisions, perhaps financial investments or bad relationships that you've given yourself to. There's going to be storms in life, amen, whether you've created them or they just happen to you. And they happen to your family. Following Jesus, firstly, is a great idea for all of us this morning. But what about following him into a furious storm? Such storms are typical of the Lake of Galilee. They result from differences in temperatures between the seacoast and the mountains that are beyond. The Sea of Galilee lies 680 feet below the sea level. It is bounded by hills, especially on the east side, where they reach 2,000 feet high. These heights are the source of cool, dry air. In contrast, directly around the sea, the climate is semi-tropical with water uh, and warm, excuse me, warm, moist air. The large difference in height between surrounding land and the sea causes large temperature and pressure changes. The results are strong winds dropping to the sea, funneling through the hills. Some people get saved and they uh, think, hey, I'm never going to have a problem again. I answered the altar call. I went to the uh, church and I prayed and uh, here I am, Lord. And uh, they think there's never going to be another problem in their life. All the decisions that uh, they've been stacking up throughout the years, the decades of life, uh, all those th things, the, those problems are just going to go away. And I'm never again going to be tested or I'm never going to have to make some hard questions hard uh, uh, decisions in my life. It's going to be a cakewalk. There won't be any problems. I gave my life to Jesus. Hey, now I'm saved. I'm protected from all harm and terror. Uh, this is not the way it seems to be going for me. And I don't know about your experience, but there still are trials in my life. It might not be drugs and alcohol. It might not be immorality in my life. But there are things uh, and trials and temptations that I go through, amen, that I need to have Jesus with me in the boat. I need to have my confidence in Jesus. Following Jesus might mean hard times up ahead for you. And then when you were serving the devil, it seemed like, you know, you were just flowing with it. It was fun. It was exciting. And uh, when you're living for God, though, you don't have those same problems. The hangovers, the lack of money or the relationships. You can't even keep any friends around because you don't know how to talk to them as a sinner. Now you're a Christian. You have different battles to face. You can love people. You can talk to them, but when you say yes to God, he brings you uh, into a fort, into the fight, into the middle of the chaos, and into a <laughs> war, into a battle. Amen. Your name uh, as a, a born-again believer is known among the gates of hell. People should be talking uh, about you. I mean, the devils and the demons should be uh, in hell trying to figure out how they can destroy you. That's the kind of Christian that you and I are called to be. And things just don't always just, it's not always easy. It's not always 
piece of cake. A furious situation. Amen. That's where the disciples found themselves. They were with Jesus, but at the same time, a furious condition occurred in their lives as they were crossing the lake. One shred of comfort that they had, Jesus was there in the middle of the storm. He was in the boat with them. Unfortunately, he was sleeping. So we, many times we go through trials in our lives and, and there's, you know, you've been waiting for something to happen and, it's, and you're just waiting. You're trying to be patient and you're like, Jesus, where are you? I thought you told me this was going to happen. And you're painfully holding on to the promises. Or maybe you have some kind of a sickness come into your home. And it's nothing that you planned for. There's an attack upon your life. An attack upon your character maybe. These things are unexpected. And they're furious. <coughs> they're attacking you. But you have Jesus. Who's with you in the middle of your storm. This is a giant thread of consolation to us. It's not just a shred. Well, Jesus is here somewhere. He's uh, in the stern. And he's covered in some blankets. So we're not sure where Jesus is in this storm. We saw him get in the boat. We were tending to the sails and uh, we were uh, making sure the lines were tied off, right? And, and so on and so forth. What happened to Jesus? Consolation is that the Creator <coughs> has gotten in the boat with us. Jesus spoke the worlds into existence. He controls uh, the wind and the sea. He is available, amen, to us. Nothing was created without Him. John 1 3. That should be a little bit of comfort to you and I when we have. Incredible things coming against us. Physical things, sicknesses, disease, uh, lack of money, horrible investments that we've made. But we find ourselves in a horrible situation. There's a furious storm that has risen up and we are in the middle of it. And thank you, Jesus, that you are here. At least you're in the boat with us. We're all going down together. And then thirdly, you can be in the boat with Jesus, God himself, but you can still be worried. You can be coming to church and doing everything right. You're paying your tithes, you're reading your Bible, you're fasting, you're involved in outreach, you're doing what God wants you to do, but you can still, even in the middle of all that, you can be anxious and worried about your situation, your personal dilemma that you're having even in the middle of church you can be worried but you go to church but you're lacking faith you're lacking that element that God is going to help me and God is going to uh, not let me drown an interesting point here is that the disciples had experienced a few miracles of Jesus by this time wouldn't you think that they're not really too worried about what's going to happen to them. They've seen Jesus work a few wonders in the book of Matthew here. They learned that Jesus was a great healer, a great physician, because uh, I believe it was a few chapters earlier, Matthew 4, where Jesus went throughout to Galilee teaching in their synagogues. Yeah, he's a great teacher. Is that helpful here when we're in the boat? Does he know uh, anything about sailing? Does he know anything about the, the winds and the seas and the waves? Does he know anything about that? He's a good teacher. He's been teaching in the synagogues. We were there. The good news of the kingdom. He's a good healer too. He healed everyone of every disease and sickness among the people. Everyone. He's a great physician. He's a great teacher. Not much of a sailor, though, I don't think. 
News spread about him all over Syria. People brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. And their experience with him was uh, in these realms here of uh, teaching or he healing them of sicknesses and people that had uh, demons. He cast them out. He, he's a healer. But we find ourselves, amen, in a dire situation where we feel like we're about to die. And there's a furious storm that has occurred in our life. And he's right there in the middle of your life, in the middle of your church. He's in the boat with you, my friend. And still, we tend to freak out. We lose it. We let our emotions get the best of us. And we're worried. <coughs> Wake up, Jesus. Don't you see that we're drowning here? You've got to do something. Help us out. Don't you care that we are perishing? We're about to drown. We're going to go down with the ship. And Jesus is there with us. And we're really tripping out here. Devil, I never gave you permission to attack my life. <laughs> surprise, 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 Sergeant Carter. Just like Gomer Pyle used to say, there's a surprise in your life. The devil is not going to get permission from you to give you a trial, to uh, give, give you a storm, to uh, get ready to, you know, annihilate you. And we wondered, God, you know, what... What are you doing in my life? This can really sidetrack you. It can really get you off track from what God has called you to do. A furious storm arises. Amen. Isn't God supposed to keep me from all of these, these frightening uh, situations? Amen. Our promise this morning is that if we believe that everything God has promised, he is going to do. He is firstly promised to be with us. Yeah, we see that one. Jesus is in the bowl with you. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Lo, even until the end of the age. Amen. He's uh, encouraging his uh, disciples as he's commissioning them to go and do a work for God, to, to go into different cities, to go into different neighborhoods, to go into different families and to preach and, uh, and to see uh, miracles occur. But flipping out won't help, man. So much that the waves were sweeping over the side of the boat. When was the last time you got in a boat? Anybody here like to get out on the lake? We went kayaking last year. Do you remember that? Okay. Well, you can't really stand up in the middle of a boat, right? Sure you can. There's a 35-foot boat. If it's a little kayak, no. That's only eight feet long. If you stand up, you're going to go, you're going down. But if you're in a big boat, sure, or a cabin cruiser, let's say, or maybe even a, a you know, a pleasure cruise. You're going in the Caribbean, you know, it's like they have tennis courts in there. That's how big they are. Nothing to worry about, right? But flipping out won't help because this boat, I'm going to say, is probably less than 20 feet long. It's a fishing vessel. And waves are coming over the side. You've got Andrew in the back. He's got a little tin can. He's uh, getting the water out of the boat. And you have uh, Peter saying, row harder, row harder. And then you have Jesus asleep in the front. The waves are coming over. And flipping out is not going to help you. It's a what? Screaming is not going to help. But finding out that the emotion of it, fearing death, COVID-19, these are frightening things. They can take my life. Have you thought about that? Getting uh, coronavirus? I know David's happy to go home and be with the Lord, but the rest of us have a couple more laps to do around the uh, jungle gym here, man. We... 
We, uh, we want to stick it out a little bit further. Amen. I do not want to die. I've had prophecies over my life that we're going to plant churches. How many have forgotten the uh, prophecy? <coughs> We've got a lot of work to do here. And so I'm fearful of that a little bit. I'm like, you think also that these disciples have a little fun with me. It would act less like little girls and more like fishermen, right? They should know about the storms. They know what they have to do. They know uh, they have experience in this realm. Most of them were fishermen, I believe, the majority of them. Let's say at least half. It must have been a serious storm for them to start uh, flipping out. Wake up, wake up, God. Are you not aware that the end has come upon us and we're all going to die? <coughs> Their emotions got the best of them. And this is where you and I fail because emotion it works contrary to faith. Emotion works contrary to faith. It's like the opposite. When you say, uh, my emotion, my feelings, and what I'm experiencing now in my mind is more important than what God has promised. And the faith to apprehend it, you get yourself in deep trouble. You flip out, and it doesn't help at all. Jesus gets a hold of them. He says, you have little faith. He's trying to reel them in. Faith will always oppose your emotions and your feelings. Feelings. I don't always feel like living for God. I don't always feel like getting out of bed for prayer in the morning. I don't always feel like doing that. But I know through the duty of it that it is good. There are many exercises that you can be involved in as a uh, disciple or as a Christian that, you know, you, you can't rest in your emotions. You can't let them guide you. We're called to walk by faith and not by sight. That means uh, you're walking by faith. That's what God has laid down in the scriptures. What God has taught you in your life. The convictions that you have adopted in your mind. This is the way I'm going to live my life. I'm not going to force it on you. You guys can do whatever you want to. But for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. You make up convictions, and those convictions make you. And it's a good place to say amen. Praise God. In this case, Scripture teaches us to walk by faith. But as the disciples, the the sailors, they're fishermen, I guess, more than sailors. They're called to row by faith, amen, and not by sight. For us, we need to believe God. Let's keep this in mind when calamity strikes. Now, listen to me. There are some here, there's all kinds of people that make up the body of Christ. Some people might not be as spiritual as you are. We have to, amen, Help those that are weaker than us. We have to encourage those who might not be as spiritually minded as you and I. We have to give them uh, a help. We have to surround our, uh, bless them and protect them. We have to encourage them and lift them up. Some others might not be as unmoving. They might not, be, they may be more like a rock, like, are you even alive? Do you have a pulse? Some people, you don't even know if they're, what they're thinking, they, they, they go through things and they just, they're just they just like, they're solid, man. They're like determined. They're like a rock. And they might ask, what's the big deal? We've, this has happened to us before. And uh, God has helped us through. And uh, there's no reason to think anything differently of God. Ooh, what did we do wrong? Uh, did we sin? Uh, what you know? You know, just these things happen, my friend. We do go through crisis. There is some insurmountable things that are 
brought upon our lives, amen, for such a time as this, things are going to happen to us. Trials. But we still need to be trusting in Jesus. This means that when Jesus is living in your heart, very simply, he will protect you. You can be going through the most horrible situation and most <coughs> just insane thing you can't understand, you can't wrap your mind around it. It's a dilemma. But Jesus is going to help you. And you have to trust him, trust in Jesus. It's like the faith that you have as you listen to the Father. The Father is going to care for you and I. We need to trust God. Amen. We can lean upon Jesus. He becomes our confidence in every horrible situation. He will also give us direction for our lives. Amen. In, in the most uh, insane, furious storm that has come upon us. He will give us direction on what we need to do. He's got the voice of reason. The voice of faith that's going to help us to trust him. And then you know that because he is full of love for us. He's deeply concerned with your life. He is interested in your well-being, your safety, your health, amen, and success to you as a born-again believer. He uh, is thinking about you right now. His care for you is endless, amen, and he <coughs> desires to help you through, amen, as long as you trust him. That is his character. That is his nature that we can rest upon. This is a poem written by A.B. Simpson. It's called, Why Everyone But God? How often we trust each other and only doubt our Lord. We take the word of mortals and yet we distrust his word. But oh, what light and glory would shine over all our days if we always would remember God means just what he says. Now, when you and I trust the name of Jesus, and we trust him for his power, he's forgiven us through his blood and his sacrifice. We have been purchased off of the slave block. Amen. And then we've been given our freedom. That's what Jesus has accomplished and he's put power into our lives. Amen. He has a personal interest in us as sons and daughters. And then we can trust him for his power. For his promises, secondly, he has given us multitudes of promises concerning his care for us. Amen. And those promises are always centered on the future and intrinsically link to our faith and trust that he will make it good. He is someone that you can trust. He is a just God. Amen. Lastly, for his persistence, we can trust him. Amen. This is not a temporary relationship. He is in it for the long haul, the continual voyage from uh, the Sea of Galilee where they got in the boat all the way across the lake my friend as you are there rowing as you see the storm you understand that God is going to be with you for the long haul for the long uh, duration of that trip his eye is on the sparrow he uh, doesn't miss anything nothing escapes his perception. So he is uh, for you through his power and his promises and in persistence. Bob Vernon writes the test of a bulletproof vest. I remember hearing Bob Vernon 
formerly with the Los Angeles Police Department, tell of how the department would test bulletproof vests and demonstrate to rookie officers their value by placing them on mannequins and then <laughs> and shooting round and round after them. They'd inspect the mannequins and see that no harm came to them. Then they'd check to see if there was any penetration. Invariably, the vests would pass the test with fine colors. Vernon would then turn to the rookie officers and ask, so who wants to wear one for the next test instead of the mannequin? Are you willing to put on the vest, my friend? Are you willing to get into the boat with Jesus? Everything looks good. Uh, you know, there's there's no <coughs> waves, there's no winds blowing. It's everything seems like it's going to be a nice trip. But we're not sure about what's going to happen. Benjamin Disraeli said there's no education like adversity. Amen. We can learn from the storm that we're involved in. Amen. And we can be tested to see if we have the genuine article. We can see like that jewel, like that diamond that was submersed in the water. Are we shining or is it dull? What does your faith reveal about you? Let's close this morning with the concept of God being in charge. And uh, in our scripture here, we see that the person that is in charge is the one who is addressed with the authority. And uh, the disciples look for Jesus in the boat. They begin to address him. Are you looking for God? Amen. Are you addressing Jesus in your moment of terror when you're flipping out or you just enjoy the noise and the confusion? Or are you desperate to have God help you? <coughs> Prayer and petition. I want you to know that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And you're going through a trial in your life. What's the first thing you do? You reach for the liquor cabinet and pull out some uh, uh, some kind of whiskey or something, or you go to the pill cabinet and you you gotta over medicate yourself, or do you go to your Bible, Amen, and find out what God wants you to do in that situation? And seeking God is the first thing that you ought to do. Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Jesus will rebuke your storm for you. It says here that Jesus got up and rebuked the winds and the waves and there was a complete calm. It's pretty amazing. Those, some of those storms are sudden. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Amen. I got to thinking about the way that a predator stalks his prey. Lion hunting. With relatively small hearts and lungs, lions are not fast runners. A maximum speed of 60 kilometers per hour, nor do they have the stamina to keep up the pace for more than uh, 100 to 200 meters. And such uh, lions rely on stalking their prey and seldom charge until they're within 30 meters, unless the prey is facing away and cannot see the charge. Lions stalk their prey, although ambush behavior has been observed. This happens mainly during daylight. Stalking prey is much more difficult. Of 1,300 hunts observed in the Serengeti, only 48% involved or only one lion. 20% involved two, and the remainder involved a group of three to eight. This is a moment of attack. 
when the prey is taken off guard. That's the way that some storms are in your life. They just show up and they show up quickly and violently in your life. I want you to know Jesus can rebuke that storm and bring calm to your life. Everything is going just fine, you think, and then all of a sudden a sickness hits your family. Somebody gets COVID. Or you find your business is tanking. It's going under, and now you have to close your restaurant or you lose your job. Right out of the blue. I want you to know the first response should be a knee-jerk response to call on God and get God involved in your situation and watch him set you up for a miracle because he will rebuke your storm. The men were amazed in verse 27. They asked, what kind of a man is this? There's a storm and it's gone and they're safe. When you and I face incredible challenges, we give God an opportunity for a miracle. And through that, God gives us an, an, an opportunity, likewise, to have a more intimate relationship with him. We can begin to learn more about who Jesus is when we get him involved in our dilemma and our storms. When we believe him and we trust him, you will come out of that storm, amen. And through that storm, you and I are tested. And we get closer to Jesus and more of an intimate relationship. Think about that. Jesus is amazing. He is always available. All the time. Even in the humdrum of life, when really there's nothing that's happening. You're on, out on the boat. There's no storms. But there's no wind either. And here you are. You're just drifting along. You're just really going nowhere quickly. And this is the humdrum. Even in the time when nothing is happening. The opposite end of that spectrum. When too much is happening. Too much is going by so quickly. And uh, we're about to die. This has been such a horrible year for most of us. I mean, I can't imagine not living for God, trying to go through 2020 because of COVID-19 and all the political unrest and all the different, the economy is, is falling apart and people's finances are whacked and people are dying I can't imagine going through that year without Jesus and having him as my confidence in the boat with me. Amen. You may be in the middle of a, a long-term battle or a trial that's not ending. You're like, God, I, I, you know, I used to be a good Catholic and I know you... You know, you, used to, you have to suffer. If you have to suffer through the trial. And if I suffer, then it's got to be over, right? Some of you have been waiting, and you're waiting, amen. God's going to help you, amen. And he's trying you, maybe through this trial that you're going through. It's an extended trial. It's a, a storm that's not letting up. But God promises to be with you. Amen. And uh, Thomas Paine wrote in the American Crisis, there are times that try men's souls. You and I are being tested. Do we have the faith? Are we calling on God? or Are we looking to him for the solution to our problem? And can we be amazed with what God does? And he calms the storm in our lives. Amen. And <clears throat> comes through as faithful when we trust him. Let's close our eyes. Amen. And believe God for miracles this morning. Perhaps you're not saved in this place. You're not born again. You've had a horrible time. You've suffered greatly through 2020. 
COVID-19 and maybe you lost your job, you're losing relationships, you lost a victory. God is calling you to higher ground, my friend. He's calling you into a relationship where Jesus will be with you if you will just believe. Where is your faith, my friend? If you today want to get saved, we're going to give you an opportunity. You're listening online or you're sitting in one of these comfortable blue chairs in the sanctuary. You're not saved and you're sick of your sin. You want to move forward in your life, but you keep hitting a brick wall. You're not growing. You're not changing. Things in your life are the same old, same old. You have the same problems, same dilemmas, same sin that you're involved in. Amen. Jesus wants to break the power of sin. He that is a servant of sin becomes a slave of sin. And you can be free right now through what Jesus has accomplished and where Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And that blood that he shed is available to you so you can be whole, so you can be healed, so you, when the storms of life come, you can be uh, protected and God will bring peace to your mind. He'll bring rest to your soul if you will pray and give your give all your cares to Jesus. Cast your cares upon Jesus for he cares for you. How many would there be you want to get saved? Amen. God sees your hand. Amen. If you're raising it online, I'm going to pray this prayer. Maybe you're backslidden and the cares of this life have choked that fruitfulness out of you. And no longer are you serving God, but you're backslidden. You do not have Jesus in the boat with you. You are all alone. And therefore, there's no one to calm the storms. And you will go down as the waves go over your life, engulf you, and you will die in your sins. If you turn, though, and repent of your sin, amen, and repent of your backsliding, let that wickedness, let that backsliding correct you and see how far you've fallen and how good God is and how gracious and kind he is and give your life back to him. Why don't you close your eyes and pray with me a sinner's prayer. Lord, we come before you desperate that you are our only hope. I thank you for the blood that you shed on the cross and uh, I repent of my sin, my mind's thinking. I give my life to you. I want to serve you all my days. I will trust you as my savior. Amen. And perhaps you prayed that prayer, you believe God. I want to believe with you. And I would like you to contact us. Let us know how you got saved and all the good that God is doing in your life. Amen. Let's all open up the altars for those Christians who just want to talk to God and want to thank God that he's there in the boat with you. Amen. He sees your dilemma. He wants to help you to believe and he wants to bring peace to your life. Let's sing this song together and change the order of our service. Thank you. 
to us. Let's call on him. Amen. Let's uh, uh, get a hold of Jesus in the crisis, in the middle of our storm. Amen. Watch what he'll do. The peace that you're looking for, my friend, is not in a bottle. It's not in a pill. It's not in another relationship. The peace that you're looking for is through Jesus. Amen. Let's go ahead and close. Bow our heads. Brother David, can you please pray for us as we leave? We thank you, Lord, that you lead us through these storms. That when they come upon us, if we look to you, we'll see the peace in the midst of the storm. And we thank you, Lord, that you go out with us. We thank you that you lead us to places of victory. We thank you that you have a plan and your plan is great, Lord. And we praise you. Amen. The Lord bless you. Thank you so much for coming. We'll see you tonight. Amen.